All right, everyone, thank, welcome to uh, 801 Labs. Um, we're really excited to have Professor Plum here with his class on embedded reverse engineering. Um, before we get into that, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, 801 Labs. We're a nonprofit hackerspace, open to the public. As you can see, nobody paid to come. It was free. But we do appreciate donations, um, considering that we need to pay rent and we're losing money. So <laughs> if we want to stay here, we need people to donate. Um, the way you do that is you go to every.org slash 801labs, um, or you can go to our website, 801labs.org, and hit that donate button. And we really appreciate it, but there's no requirements. Um, again, nonprofits, you can do all that fun tax stuff, and nobody makes money, so that's really nice too. Anyway, so with that done, we're going to turn the time over to Professor Plum. Um, really excited. We haven't had you talk here before? Ever? So. Ever. This is your big debut. <laughs> oh no. Stress. <laughs> Pressure. Um, just, just a little bit about underwear. Just a little bit about Waylon. I, I, I well, I've known much. you okay. for yeah. a few years and um, he's probably one of the people that I look up to most. So if you want to learn, meet someone that's really good in the industry and knows a lot of stuff, Talk to, to Waylon. He's a, he's a great resource and he's really nice. So thank you so much. We're excited to have you. Thanks. Uh, I have my own intro slide, but he kind of took care of it for me. Uh, but needless to say, I've been here, I've been doing IT stuff, security stuff for 20 years. Uh, next year. Next year will be 20 years. Um, but uh, yeah, so I work at Stage 2 Security, but before that I was at Symantec, a uh, three-letter government agency, and then some local stuff here in Utah. Early, early on in my in my lifetime, and then I don't know. I've done lots of fun things. Last year, Bash and I were able to uh, compete with Mike's badge and, and get a, a DefCon black badge. So that was really cool. That's my most recent exciting uh, achievement. But um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about reverse engineering today. Um, just kind of a quick overview, right? Like reverse engineering. When I think of reverse engineering, I think I'm usually talking about reverse engineering machine code. Um, where machine codes you typically generated by a programming language similar like C, um, sometimes Go, sometimes Rust, but usually C in, in the case of the, what, most of the stuff I'm working on. So you're going to have like C, you know, files that are the compiler takes them and it, it puts it into assembly code, uh, object files, and then the linker takes all those uh, different assembly files and whatever necessary libraries and then turns that into machine code. And that's what gets put either on firmware or it turns into your binary. Um, and so reverse engineering is just the process of taking that ma the machine code, turning it back into assembly and you know whatever data structures align with that. And then some reverse engineering tools can also try to decompile that to take that assembly back to C code. Uh, but it's a very lossy process in the compilation. And so coming backward, you don't get all the data, plus it's a little bit of guesswork. So for example, in the C code you might know the function name, there's comments, the variable names, um, but along the way most of that can get lost and so when it comes back out you're just like, oh, some function, sub 75 whatever, I have no idea what the original variable name was, so I'll just call it var1, we'll call this var2. Um, and another thing, I, I mean, other things kind of get changed. So, like here in the initial, like it's you know the x was set to 65 and y is set to 72. But maybe the tool will reverse that and think, oh, var one set to the letter a because 65 is asking for the letter a, right? Like we're just guessing here on, on the way back, where it kind of guesses based on the context of how it's being used. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. Um, this process right here, the decompile. It, there's not a tool that I've seen that does that very, very well. There's tools that do a pretty good job, but there's always loss there. Even this process isn't always clear, because when things get made into the binary, right, like any static variables or any strings or any structures get thrown into bits just like the code does, right? And so the decompiler needs to be able to figure out this was code and this is um, data and this is structures and this is a jump table. And so sometimes it gets it right, sometimes it gets it wrong, and then there's the, and then we won't even bring on top of that like the anti-reverse engineering trick that you can try to do to fool the decompiler, where you use something that is code as data, as so the decompiler is like, I don't know what this is. Uh, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. You can you can do things to get it off. Um, we'll talk about that somewhat, but 
not very much on the intro class. But that's just kind of the, the general overview, right? We're going to talk about, we, we may talk about this a little bit more, but most of the time we're going to spend here and here, and maybe a little bit of how to get from here to here, uh, because sometimes that's not clear how to get from this to this, especially in the world of embedded. Um, okay, so why? Why do we even want to do that? Why do we even go on and go backwards? This is where you get to contribute. Tell me, why do we even care? Why would you think reverse engineering? Yes? You want to understand, uh, do malware analysis. Okay, malware analysis, huge one. Yes. It's like, I need like a family feud, like, <laughs> that's the number one answer. Yes. I want my motors to work without the, uh, without the licensing server. Okay, so you want to reverse how this hardware works. How do a driver talk to hardware, right? Okay, that, that's a great answer too. That is on my board here, yes? I'm looking to get money for a bug bounty. So okay. So, vuln hunting. Vulnerability, yep, research, exploit dev, yep. Replacing the dependencies of closed source software with open source software. Oh, very good. Yes, that's actually how I got my start in, in reverse engineering. Um, I'm going to tell that tangent now. Long time ago, um, when the Google phone, the first Google Android phone was coming out, right? Um, I had like a Windows CE phone back in the day. Like, I don't know. This is this was the dumbest idea Windows had. No, Windows has had some <laughs> bad ones. But the CE phone was like it was actually kind of cool. But we wanted to port the CE, to the Windows tool, to Linux so that we could run Android on it, right? And the phone had Windows drivers for the touchscreen, but we didn't have Linux drivers for that particular touchscreen. And so that's where I got my start in reverse engineering to do take a proprietary driver to an open source driver so that we can, I could run Android on my mobile phone. So, yes? Um, maybe finding out how software works to make an open source version of it, similar to what he said, but... Not for hardware. ...drivers uh -huh. and just pure software? Yes, yes. Not that I condone this, but piracy. Yes, piracy, <laughs> crack, right? Cracking games. It's, it's, it's totally games. like, yeah. and, and you, you, <laughs> we act like that's the first one that's like maybe illegal, but actually, some of these we've already talked about are potentially illegal, right? Like reversing a software to make an open source version of it may be illegal. It, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to say any of this is legal. You'll need to be very careful about what's right, what's wrong, what's legal. But a lot of it. Um, yeah, a lot of it's questionable area and gray area, right? Like it's not really even clear if you can or can't do something reverse engineering. So here's some of the ideas I had. I think you pretty much hit them all. Understanding, uh, reversing malware, um, debugging, right? Like even your own stuff, just like why the freak is my program behaving the way it is? Sometimes the compiler does things that you're like, how did, well, that's not what I wanted, right? Uh, porting drivers we talked about, exploit vulnerability, even just security audits, making sure software you have is, is valid. Um, maintaining legacy hardware sometimes. Like, like video games and old consoles. Yes, yeah. yeah. Or even in, even in a per company level, so I like, we have the software, we lost the source code to it, we need to, we need to interface with X, Y, or Z. So figure out what developer from old times did. Uh, game crash you mentioned, and then um, Actually, if you're not only just exploit dev, but like writing tools, malware type tools, or anti-RE, then you're typically doing RE to see if your anti-RE works. So yeah, a lot of, lot of actually applicable areas, not just, just, this is like the huge one, but there's a whole lot more than that. Um, so when I'm reverse engineering, I often feel like this dude, right? Um, when you're reverse engineering, there's a whole lot of data there. There's a whole lot of functions there and you're trying to gather context around them, and you're trying to figure out like what this means, and you're kind of working off of assumptions a lot of the time, trying to draw your conclusions. And it's not that you have to work off assumptions, it's just that reverse engineering is extremely time consuming. And so it's like you want to do the least amount of actual reverse engineering as you, you have to, because there's always like something else part of the code, like, oh, there's this, I didn't even reverse that. Um, especially when I'm working with a junior malware an analysts, right, they want to just like start at the top of the program and go through every function and find out what it does. And they're like, well, no, just get like the gist of what the malware does. We don't need to know what every little function does because it's not worth the time and effort. So if, if, to get good at reverse engineering, you get good at being lazy. Um, just try to figure out the quickest way to get to what you want, make assumptions about how it's being used, and get out. As soon as you can get what you need, like. Walk away, let it go. Um, I didn't mean for that to, to be animated. There we go. 
So here's where a lot of the tools that I use for reverse engineering. Um, we've got on this side, I've got static analysis tools and uh, dynamic tools. We'll talk about what that means. Um, I'm a huge IDA fan. IDA is the has been for the longest time the, the main reverse engineering tool of a lot of professional reverse engineers. However, it comes with an expensive price tag. Right? Just to do the de disassembly part um, of mo a lot of common processors, it's like, like per user license, I can't even remember what the price is for sure, don't quote me on this, but it's like $3,000, right? And then if you want to do decompilation where we turn the assembly back into code and use its hex race tool for that, that's like another $3,000 per architecture, right? So if you want x86, that's 3,000. ARM, that's another 3,000. ARM64, that's another 3,000, right? So you're like, here's 12 grand to do um, just uh, your, your x86, x64, and ARM. Like your, your general processors that you see in most computers, that's, that's a hefty cost for that product yearly. It's not really hobbyist friendly. No, it's not. Um, there is a hobbyist friendly portion, though. They do have a freeware version for yes. the community. Yes. So they used to do a community edition that was like a whole major version behind. Like when 6 came out, they had like, okay, 5 is free, right? With, with limitations. And now they do, is it just the online one or is it download? It, it is downloadable. Okay. I got it on Linux. I think, I, this is my belief, I think this kind of pushed their hand there because. <laughs> They weren't very. They weren't very good about it. the the free version. Was a clearly a huge release behind. The, the Considering Ghidra is free. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Ghidra. Ghidra. Sorry. Yeah, Ghidra is growing in popula popularity. Um, so that that is a NSA developed tool that they open sourced. I was shocked to see how much of that they open sourced. It um, it's a really great tool at reversing a lot of different architectures and processors, and it can do decompilation, not just disassembly. Um, it's written in Java, and to be honest, I it's great. I, it's just not like I had an opportunity. I went with Ida, and so I never really learned Ghidra, and I still just prefer Ida. And it's, for me, it's a personal it's a it's a personal thing. But I think because learning a new tool tool sucks. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. But but I think my days are numbered. I think eventually I'm gonna have to, to bite the bucket and go. And and Ghidra is um, improving all the time. But there's other tools. Before Ghidra's release, these ones also were starting to steal market share from IDA. Binary Ninja is still pretty cool. Uh, Red R is pretty cool. And Hopper's great, especially for OSX. Um, it does, it's probably, if you're looking to reverse specifically OSX binaries, Hopper's pretty cool for that. And it does the compilation too. And it's a lot cheaper. It's like $99. It's like well, 45 bucks. Oh, and that was it cheaper? Yeah, it's like been that. a while. So this is... Well, I guess for maybe the student license. And Red R is free. Uh, Binary Ninja's got a cheap... Cheap too, but it's it's no. It's They're like one hundred and twenty bucks. Oh, pst, I mean, compared it's to not three <laughs> grand. You're right. It's not even a grand. So that's that's <laughs> these tools. And they, um, Ida has built some built-in static and or dynamic uh, capabilities as well. Um, I don't know. I can't speak to the others as well. If they know, I know that if they do, uh, Ghidra you can tie in with GDB or WinDebug to do um, dynamics. But you can do the same with Ida. So these are dynamic tools for, and that's what I mean by dynamic tools is static tools, you just look at the, the assembly, but you're not running it. You're not letting it execute in any separate form. And these tools, you will let it execute, and you're trying to step through the process, which is helpful because you can look at, you can poke into register values, you can look at memory segments and see like what's it doing. Like when it's decrypting data, right, to hand deroll that is sometimes a pain. So sometimes you'll let it run up until the point where the data is decrypted, but then don't let it like run that data, right? Like payloads, malware analysis type things like that. You're just trying to get the key or something. Right, you're, or you're just trying to get the key, like same con challenges too. Like we do a lot of those. Um, Windybug, mainly for Windows, but it's great. Especially when it, um, you can reference internal structures and it can pull, automatically pull symbols from Microsoft's and report like, so like, like, you know, kernel 32 and NTDLL. Right, like when you're when the malware or the executable calls into those, this can automatically go fetch the symbols and be like, oh, it's calling this function in that, and it help, and can I help you out? It'll tell you like, oh, this structure is a Windows structure, and it'll populate the fields for you. Oli, Oli's had its heyday. I think Oli's on its way out. It's older. And then GDB is Linux, and then there's LLDB for um, OS X, but um, it's basically GDB with all the commands changed. It's pointless in my mind, but whatever. Why they changed it? Um, is there a preference between static or dynamic? It seems like there's a lot more invested in static. 
Yes, there's a lot more invested in static. That's a good point. Um, I don't know, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Sometimes you can't run it for whatever reason, right? Like it's not complete, it's only a segment. Maybe you pulled it out of memory. Um, and then other times, like if, in terms of malware, like if you are letting it run, there's a chance that it can escape, right? So you always, malware, you always do in a VM, but even then there's, there's fears. I had, a mal, I had a VM that had a shared drive between my host and the VM, right? And it was able to grab files from my shared drive um, yeah. So, there, there, yeah, there's things you need to be careful um, when you're working with malware that way. Is, is there a nice GUI for GDB? There is one. I wouldn't say nice, but there is a GUI. <laughs> Jira, <laughs> Jira Peta. will do it. Yes. There's, so, uh, there's a Python tool called Peta uh -huh. that does help GDB become a lot more digital. Yeah, and so, like, like, like yeah, so I, I don't know that tool, but I've seen GUIs before um, that use the, that cover GDB. Ida and Ghidra, I know at least, and I think Red Arts does too, but I don't know these three as well. They can tie into a GDB server, and so you're looking at the code from their view, and they're showing you, hey, this is where it's executing right now, and so you don't even need to know the GDB commands. Um, like, they'll start, stop, expect, inspect the memory uh, natively for you. I, I should preface, Peta is a CLI tool still, but it does make it a lot easier to read with color coding and stuff. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And okay, so I, Compu Kid came in early and asked this question. He asked me, "Why am I going to talk about ARM today? Why not x86? Right? Like, what Windows PCs? Like x86? Like, like that's what everything is. Um, when you think of a standard computer, yes. But when you think of uh, CPUs and machine and MCUs that are out there, m my ARM." totally blows away the number of CPUs developed and out there in the world, right? Like, where an ARM processor is, just throw out some ideas. Tell me some, I bet you've got at least three on your body right now, tell you the truth, but give me ideas. Yeah, yeah, bingo. Oh. Cell phone. Two on your cell phone. Raspberry Pi. Yep, a Raspberry Pi, yep, you yep. Um, yep, your charger even, your, your, your Apple ID, yep, uh, um, yep. So like I've got my Mac, right? It's got multiple, I've got that touch bar, it, that's running on its own ARM processor. Your car has how many, right? Like your, your entertainment system, the front display, the, the CAN bus controller, like each, like ARM, <laughs> yeah, your remote, like these things are everywhere. And it's not just small things too, right? Like my, every one of your cell phones have been ARM processors from almost the get-go, really. And um, process, I've, got a, I've got an M1 Mac at home. I not have, don't have it here. But ARM slowly make niching away at the x86 world as well. So I'm, I'm suggesting ARM because if you're getting started, don't start on an architecture that's on its way out. Start on something that's going to be around. Like this is taking over. This is what you're going to want to know. It's going to be the most beneficial to you, in my opinion, going forward. Um, yeah, more talk about the number of processors that are ARM, right? Like it's just taking off like crazy exponentially. Um, and that's where I'm going to get the end of the slides. Well, I've got one more slide, but I'm not going to talk about it now. So. What I brought, I've brought an ARM processor that I, I pick on these a little bit often. This is a dev board. It's, um, it's called a Blue Pill. It's like two bucks from China. It's really cheap. But it's got a, a STEM processor that, that's an ARM, a, a STEM32, um, what, is, what is it, ST Electronics? Is that what yeah, they call them? STM. STM, ST Microelectronics. Do you want us to shut the thing so it's not your eyes? No, 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 you're fine. I can. I can deal with it. And so I'm going to, this is an uh, ARM processor, and this is what I'm going to start with. And what I'm going to do is we're going to just make a little basic program, kind of talk about reverse engineering it. But I have an end goal where I'll, um, a friend of mine reached out to me. Actually, we'll talk about that. Here we go. A friend of mine reached out to me. Um, so I guess there's this, you know, Disney Infinity, right? Like, I guess it's discontinued. I, somebody can help me here because I'm not the most familiar. It, it is Disney Infinity, and it is discontinued at this point. Okay, um, and it's got this little base that reads these NFC um, figures, right? Uh, so people have written a clone for the base that this little is based on one of those same chips, and it's got this little display. But it, this can mimic any one of those devices. It's got like an SD card somewhere over right there, and then, then it'll mimic each one of those devices. So you plug this into the Wii and you just say on the screen, hey, I want to be Elsa, and it 
pretends that you just set Elsa on the stand. Um, so somebody made this software that, that mimics this, but he didn't make it open source. And um, uh, somehow my friend was like, oh, he'll, he'll, if you send him the serial number of your device, he'll make you a copy that works with your serial number. I don't know if he had to buy it or whatnot, but he, my friend, would, he has kids, right? This is a kid's thing. And the kids would just break the USB right off this. And so like, he went through three to four times where he's like, here's my new serial number. Here's my new serial number. And then finally he's like, look, this is, the guy's getting a little less responsive. And this is an annoying process. So he reached out to me and he's like, can we subvert this, like, have to give him my serial number every time thing? And so that's what I'll go through tonight is hopefully, if we can get there, we'll talk about how, how we figured out how to subvert that method. Um, but before we get to that far, let's start with something a little easier. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, so that's kind of small, that's a little bigger. I'm going to start with an Arduino, um, the software. So this is the Arduino IDE. These chips um, have been ported so that you can write Arduino uh, in, um, sketch, sketch is the right word, sketches to it. So let's make a simple sketch, and then we'll take that binary and take a look at it and reverse it. Um, when I typically start, or I tell people to start reverse engineering, I still do this today when I'm looking for something. I'll write something in C, compile it, and then see how it looks in reverse in, in Ida, because I know what it's supposed to look like. It helps me understand, oh, well, that's what it's doing. That's what's going on here. So that's kind of what we'll do. Um, let's say, I'm not going to write a sketch. Let's just find something. Do a blink. Blink. We could do blink. It's pretty boring, though. Okay. <laughs> um, at least something that's got a string in it. Hello world. Up in that communication, there's one that mentioned the ask. Morse. That sounds great. Yeah, where did, oh, I opened it over here. Yeah, let's try this one. All right. So blink and Morse. <laughs> okay. So yeah, this is like just an extension of blink. It just blinks to a pattern. So this is um, some sketch. It looks like it. There's this Morse code. I don't even know what it means, but it looks like it just does a while loop, and for a dash it does this, for a dot it does this, and for a space it does that, and it loops infinity. Um, looks like I'm going to have to change one thing, and that is for this chip, the LED is on that pin, so that should be good. And I've got verbose um, messages on, so I'm just going to compile this. And, okay, great, it's done. So I have verbose messaging on because I want to show you something. If you have verbose messaging on, you can see the full path to where it writes these files. And you'll see it created a file that is actually maplemorrisino. That's way small. Yeah, it needs to be like three or four times. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. There we go. Okay, so it made an ELF file. What's an ELF file? Linux executable. A Linux executable, right? This chip does not run Linux, right? So why did it make an ELF executable? Anybody? Convenience for converting into another format. Bingo, right? We've already got GCC that compiles ARM, like this, it'll make an ELF as part, as a byproduct of making this bin file. So what I'm gonna do the bin file is what gets actually loaded on the chip um, when you do an upload. I'm just going to go find this path and we'll go steal those files. Ooh. Windows are over here. Okay, I'm just going to steal these files. Give me a second. Uh, what? I'll do it here. Okay, there's that folder. So I'll take the elf and the bin. I'll set them on a shared drive with my VM. And then, okay. So here's my Windows VM. I'm using a, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Work pay time. <laughs> oh goodness. Okay, this this will work. 
Oh, look, it's Jenny Tones. Yeah, you can see <laughs> <when> they... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, you're good. That's good. That's, um... Okay, so here's my two files. I'm going to... Let's open... What is that resolution? I'm going to open my copy of Ida. This is an older version of Ida, but it still works. It's good. Is this a uh, licensed hacked version? No. Or? So I had it's. It is my. It's licensed to me. It's just an older version because I stopped paying them twelve thousand dollars every year. Um, actually, my company stopped paying them twelve thousand dollars every year. Put it that way. Um, so let's find that file. We're going to open that elf file. So here I put it in Ida. Now an elf has a header that tells you exactly it's for this architecture. Um, here's each section of the file, right? So Ida knows how to parse an ELF file. It says, oh, this is an ELF for ARM. Let me add it. You just say, okay. I just like, hey, do you want me to load the dwarf information? We'll just say yes. So it's going to um, read the structures. So this is telling me about ARM. Um, ARM has an interesting history. Every art, every language has an interesting history, right? Like x86 morphed into x64, and along the way there was different steps. ARM's kind of the same way. There was ARM instructions for the processors, and each ARM instruction was four bytes. Every instruction was four bytes, which was really good for reverse engineer, because I knew at every four bytes there was a new instruction. Where like x86, some instructions are one byte, some instructions are eight bytes, some are three, right? Like you'd never know, like is this the start of one instruction and the end of another? It was kind of hard to tell. So ARM had four bytes, that was beautiful. And then somebody's like, you know what? This takes up a lot of space to do every instruction for four bytes. We could do some instructions in one or two bytes. So they came up with a thumb mode where the, so now ARM knows ARM, like the ARM processor can run in ARM mode or it can run in thumb mode, which is like smaller than your ARM, get it? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's how they come up with it. <laughs> so, in thumb mode, the instructions are variable size and it's meant to be smaller, which works great for microprocessors because microprocessors don't have a lot of space. So thumb mode is typically, when you're writing for microprocessors, thumb is mode is usually what it's in. And so this just, I just just telling me, hey, you need to let me know what mode I need to deter interpret this in. And so we'll say okay. And um, by default, so I just like, oh, okay, here's the elf binary and I know where the main is. Like the, there's the entry point and I can find the main. And so here's the main, and oh, I'm gonna do one other thing. Um, so by default, when ELF, when in many operating systems, when they compile stuff, the function names get mangled, they get decorated basically, which is telling them this function takes these parameters, it gets put in the, the function name so that the compiler knows like how to, how to call it. But what we're gonna say is just demangle the names. I don't care for the decorated name. Show me the demangled names. And so here's the Ida decompile of this, um, or de uh, disassembly of this. Here's main. Um, it pushes uh, LR and R3 to the stack. Um, what this LR is your load register. This is a typical prolog for a function, right? Like there are set number of registers with the, the processor has to work with. And some of them by convention are saying, in this function, if you are messing with these registers, you need to save their values and restore them when you're done so that whoever called you can have their values, right? And then there's like three or four registers that are like general use saying, when something calls your function, you can blow those away and I will count on them being blown away when you return. So there's some registers like, you can blow them away, I don't care. Other registers, if you mess them up, please restore them when you return from your function. The processor, take, the compiler takes care of all that, but that's what this is. This is a prolog, and then at the end, if well, this function doesn't ever return, but if it did, you'd see it restore those those registers. But anyways, in this main, we see branch to setup, a function called setup, and then down here we see a branch to loop, and then it just loops around the function loop, right? And that makes sense if you know Arduino, because Arduino, you write a setup function, and then it's called once, and then the loop function is called repeatedly. So, <laughs> everybody see that? Holy cow. Yeah, I can read it. <laughs> it doesn't even want to let me zoom in. It's crazy. That is a lot simpler than most x86 programs. <laughs> All right. So, few things. First off, it knows the names of all these. How does it know the name of these functions? 
Because I told you that kind of data gets lost. They're in the elf file. They're in the elf file, with right. Symbols, them with symbols, because you compile it with symbols. Yes, yes, the elf file has the symbols compiled with it. So Ida's matching the symbols to the locations and saying and putting the names in there for me. That's how it says setup right there. That's how it knows that this function is called setup and this one's called loop. Yeah. And so if we look into setup, I double clicked on setup, um, here's the setup function. And so we got two values being set and then it's calling pin mode, right? Um, so it said it's, there's a zero, which, what do you think that means? Well, we can just go look. Like, so here we go, setup. It's probably turning it off. Yep, output is a zero and LED pin LED pin, which is defined as PC13, turns into 20 in hex. Um, anybody want to guess how that turns into 20 in hex? Uh, PC13 is probably some compiler flag for whatever that ends up being. Yeah, so each pin is assigned, each pin has a, a number, right, um, in, in the microprocessor, and so that pin, PC13, uh, PC13 would probably equal 32 here, uh, is what I would assume. I'm not 100% sure on that. But then you can see it calls into pin mode to set that. We, we can jump into pin mode. Pin mode is this huge switch table, this whatever. This is an SDM chip? I yes. think they have 16-bit pin registers. So yeah. if you've got A and B, that would put you at 31. So 30. C is 32. Yeah. There you go. There you, that's right. That would, that would make sense. Um, PC13, though, would oh, put me at like, yeah, well, no, that. It's, but it's close. Something along those lines. Okay, so I'm gonna. Sh there's not much here. Let's go back to the loop function. See if it looks any better. Oh, that's pretty boring. That's right. There's our string. Like Ida's good enough to say, oh yes, here's a string, and it's being passed to send Morris. And then we can look and send Morris, and send Morris. Here's the same prolog. Um, it does some funky stuff. Look, it looks like it's doing funky stuff. I but really, it's taking that dots and dashes. Now look at that. It still even has the name of that variable because of symbols, right? That symbol, the symbols are passed along. So it compares that to 2D. Why is it comparing that to 2D? Uh, Let me give you a hint. But ASCII characters 2D? Dash. That is sick. <laughs> so 2E? It's a dash. Yeah. Dot. That's a dot, right? So here's, here's where it's like, I just trained this best. It's like, oh, it's comparing this number to this number. It's like, yes, it is, but show me that number in the ASCII form, right? And 20, this is one that, I, that you see a lot is a space. So there, that you can kind of see this tree where it, if it's a... Um, if it's a dash, this branch, if this is means first compare with set to bit, and it says branch if equal. So if it's equal, it's gonna take this route, and if it's not equal, it'll take this route. So branch if equal, do this thing. Digital write, you know, it's gonna set the, the LED. Um, and it's setting the and it's writing a value to R0, and that's the that value gets passed to delay. Um, so Whenever you call a function in ARM setup, when you call a function, these parameters are passed via registers. The first one's in R0, and the second one's in R1. So digital write is being passed the pin number and a one. And the one means high, zero means low. So we're setting the pin 20, which we learned was PC13, high right here. That's what that's doing. And then here on the space, we're setting, um, we're moving this into zero. Huh. That's funny because this 20 in here is actually not meant to be a space. It's meant to be our, our pin. So pin 20, setting it low. So the delay, where is the, the timestamp being sent for delay? I don't see our, I don't see R0 set right before this. Anybody know? It's set at the end of the previous chunk. That's right. Yeah. So for a dash, it's set here to, to we're going to make this decimal number, it's 300. Awesome. And at a dot, it's set here up to also 300. I guess the, the downtime's the same, right? Or the, the on time's the same. Maybe the downtime's not. I'm not sure. And then they're 100 for the, these other two cases. So let's go. Let me think about that real quick. So on, oh, this is the path for a dot, right? If it's equal to dot, 
then yeah, it's only on for 100. If it's equal to a dash, it's on for 300. And if it's equal to none of those, then it's assuming a space, which is off for 300. Because uh, those are the, those two are right above, you've got the number one, uh -huh. and that's you know turning it on. And then down here, you've got the number zero, which is turning okay, it cool. Got it. Cool. So the, I, I did this, this cool chart thing, right? Like, this is pretty cool. You can turn that off. Oh, where's the first? You're in magnifier. I am in magnifier. How the heck do I get over there? With Just move your mouse to the left. There you go. It follows. OK, thank you. So here it is. Um, let me jump to send Morris. It's up here. Like, here it is not made in that nice graph, right? The same thing. And it's not very easy to read here. But it's still readable, and if I put my mouse on this branch, it's telling me, oh, that jumps down to here. And um, this branch here jumps back up to there, you know? So it's not as pretty. I did this really cool, makes that really pretty. Um, but this is still just disassembly. So I have the ARM decompiler for this, so I can tell it, hey, try to make the C code. And look at that. It's... Cool. That's pretty way close. Easier it's pretty that. close to C, to, to the original. It did a really good job here. It's got a lot of information to help it. It knows, hey, dots and dashes, so while, forever. Like this, you look at this, I mean, the variable names are kind of funky, but it's pretty close to this, right? Like we, the, so notice one thing, that every one of these, this has digital write delay, digital write delay. That's not here. Right? It's not the same in that sense. We only have two delay calls, and they're at the bottom. It does, the code does the same thing, but it doesn't look like the original code. Why? Yes? Is it because uh, Arduino is not the first, last step? It has to go into C first, and this is... Um, so, like compiler optimizations. Yeah. 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 Did you, you want to add to that? So when you saying. turn it from C to assembly to push it to the Arduino, it does some compiling and optimizing. Yes. And then doing the disassembly yes. just shows the optimized code. Done right. To to so you're, 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 you guys have got that right on the head, right? Like, we're not going to, the, the compiler did some optimization. It's like, hey, I know I can just set the variable and then call this once instead of having it, like, all the paths do the same thing. They all end with a turn off the light and delay. So I can just optimize it. And then when we disassemble it, we get to see the optimized version. So when you're writing like GCC, right? Like if you do the dash OS, that's gonna optimize for size and that's gonna do something like this where it's gonna try to make it as small as possible. And if you, you know, turn off optimization, then it'll, then if we looked at this binary, it would look pretty close to the original source code. Okay, we, we're feeling pretty good with what we've seen so far. Like we got an idea of this function. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna look over here, clear over here, wow. So see all these functions? These are all these are all functions in this this uh, elf file. There's a huge number of them, and we don't call half of these, right? But they're still compiled into the the binary. This is now we have symbols, so we can see the names of these. But this is why I talk about with Ida being like, there's always more, right? Like there's this huge list of functions for a simple program that just blinks the lights. Like this is the meat of the program right here. So if you were reversing and you didn't see these names and you started at the top and worked your way down, you would be three months before you found out what this program does and your mind would be weeds deep in stuff that's completely irrelevant. Um, and that's just, that's just reverse engineering. It, you get a lot of noise in the process. How do you like to filter out the noise? Um, I try to ignore it. <laughs> I try to get to, I try to, get to uh, what I want to get to. So for example, in this case, let's say I didn't have symbols. What's something I could do to try to find the, this um, the, the meat? If I didn't know where I was, here, I'll... You could probably search for a dot or a dash. Yeah, yes. Dot. So a single character is hard to search for, right? Because... But the string. But the string, yes. right? Like if I knew what the string was... Like this is going to be blinking a light, right? So you could probably record the light and figure out what the dots and dash and try and look for that dots and dash string uh -huh. in the actual code somewhere. So I'm going to say I want to look... Where is that? <coughs> Probably over here somewhere. You could always do a you know hex down code. You know, hold on guys, this is getting annoying. I'm gonna try to set my resolution to something reasonable. 
This is crazy. That's not reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> Can I see your glasses? Are they just magnifying glasses? Um, let's go about Tim's there. Side work. Just don't know it. Yeah, that's this is doable. Is this doable? Uh, yeah. yes. Choose a resolution that's widescreen. Oh well, I couldn't see before. How about this one? <laughs> there you go. Okay, it's a little better. Yeah, yeah. I was shooting in the dark. Okay, this is better. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, hey, look for a pattern. Look for that string pattern. And it's like, hey, that's not binary. That's not hex. Do you want me to look for like this text string? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we want. She's like, sure enough, it found the string right here in the the elf file. It says, hey, this is read only data. Ida's really cool about this. I could say, okay, hey, this this string that's in read only data. I hit X and say, tell me where it's referenced. Uh, no, there is. I know there is. <laughs> Don't tell me that it isn't being referenced. You even know it's being referenced right here. So it's telling me right here, hey, it's being referenced right there. And so I just double click on that, and it took me right to the loop function where that string's being used. Uh, so okay. if you like. This one that started at main and we found it that way. But like in huger programs, you're like, I just want the part where um, it asks me for the CD key, right? So if I know the message that says, sorry, invalid key, I go look for that string and say, where's that string being referenced? Oh, it's right here. And there's this if statement above it. Like you get to what you need without having to reverse this huge whatever, right? In shortcuts, take your cheats as much as you can. Yes. So say you're, you're just doing your stock analysis. Uh -huh. um, and you see, you know, the OS pop up with uh, this executable's reaching out to there, mm -hmm. and you have grabbed that domain name, and so that would be an ideal place to start searching. Yeah, for. yeah. If you, yeah, you could look for that string in the binary. Um, yeah. Malware likes to revert. Malware is like they well, I mean, they'll, they'll play games they'll with play you, games, right? Right, but but yeah, but in theory. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. Nope. So, I was actually going to ask a question along that line. So, what, how, what are ways you can detect or find ways around string obfuscation? Yeah. Like this. So, like, if there was a URL uh -huh. or an IP address that you were looking for, how would you defeat their obfuscation techniques? Yeah. So, on a, so this binary is, is compiled, is statically compiled, so it has no imports. It's like not calling any libraries, which makes sense because this is a chip that doesn't have a whole Linux operating system, right? But a Windows binary, you can't like static compile all the Windows things or Linux like you, syscalls. You can't static compile a syscall. You just gotta call the syscall, right? So you can go here to like imports tab, and this will list all the functions that the binary imports. What's a function that the binary is going to call when it's going to call out to a URL? Okay. Socket. Yeah, Bingo. Socket. So you can go look for the import of the socket, see where socket's being called, and kind of look around there. Or connect yeah, if you want to get even more precise. Yeah. Um, so that, so things like that that give you some leeway to where you want to go. Because Work backwards. Now you know it's creating a socket connection, yep. and therefore it's establishing a network connection. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. Even if that's on the loop, it, loop back interface or somewhere, but at least you have an idea of what's going on. Yeah, and I mean, that's, and that gets into even the triage before reverse engineering, right? But there's tools that'll list what functions this binary calls, right? And you can get list and see, oh, it's calling socket, it's calling connect, it's calling, you know, Get keyboard at a sync. You're like, oh, like, this is a key logger and it's reporting data back. You know, whatever. You can just look at that and get a good idea without actually having to reverse engineer. Again, shortcuts. You know, don't 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 beat yourself up if you don't need to. Right. Cool. We got this. Yes. This is gonna get ugly quick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> okay. So. We like it. Um, we had the elf, right? Now let me show you the same thing but the bin file that gets loaded to the binary, to the, I mean, firmware, excuse me. Ida's like, whoa, I've got no idea what this is. Like, there's no header, there's no signature. This is just data. What do I do with this? We know that this is for a ARM chip. Uh, more so, we know it's an ARM little Indian chip. So I'll tell Ida, hey, this is an ARM, this is ARM code. And that's like, oh, oh, you want me to do ARM? Yeah. And then it's like, okay, well, where's this, like, is this just start at zero? Like, what is this memory, right? Like, what is this data? And so this takes a little bit of knowledge about your particular target. Um, and I've got that right here somewhere. Where is my browser? That's right here. 
Okay, so let's see. There we go. This is the. Nope, that's not what I want to show you. This one. There we go. So this is the data sheet for this family of processors. Um, I'm sure Mike probably could tell you this off the top of his head. Can you zoom but, <laughs> oh yes, I can do that. Um, here it says, here's the memory layout of this chip. And the main memory, the flash memory, starts at address uh, eight, I don't know how many zeros that is. Six. 800, yeah. That address, eight, eight, 800,000 eight. or whatever, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, we'll, we'll get back to this. Give me a second. I may need to leave that window open. It's because you specified thumb mode. Everything's smaller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's small, right? This is what we were doing before, right? Yeah. Okay, I had to hit cancel because I couldn't read that. Um, let's just do it this way. Here's the file. We want it to be ARM Lilinian. Yes. And the wrong start address is that value we stole from over there. It starts with a zero. Zero X. No, no. Uh, there you go. No, it was good. And then load this at that same address. Now, I'm going to tell you something is that is this chip is not a native Arduino chip. In fact, I'm writing directly the part of this chip that like reads the talks to Arduino software and loads the firmware also resides on the chip. So what it has is a bootload, that's called a bootloader, and that bootloader actually resides at this 8000 address and it shifts everything and moves the, it actually loads the image at um, 4, uh, 4, 2000, what is that? So some, uh, some offset. So it resides at that first, two, what is 2000 in hex? That's how many bytes, I'm, why is it 1K or 8K? The first 8K are um, reserved for the bootloader. And so this is going to get loaded at that offset. Um, why does this matter? Why does it, is this important? Yes. Anybody, why? Because that's where a code starts. That's where our binary is getting flashed to. That's yeah. where our important stuff is. If I put in wrong values here, I will still put it there in that. It'll show me it and reverse it as if the memory is right. But any reference in the code where it's like jump to this address, all the jumps are relative and they're going to be off. So it's going to be like jump to here and I was going to be like that memory doesn't exist, right? So like if you get this right, you're helping Ida help you get this data. Even still, I'm going to tell it put it there and it's going to be that same um, thumb arm thing so and it's just so okay. Sorry, why were there two boxes, one for the ROM address and one for loading address? Yes. So um, the I what I could have done and I should have done there was the ROM address started at 8,000, but the load address started at 8,000, or 800,000, 2,000. Does that make, or 8 million, 2,000. The, the image didn't get loaded at the root of the ROM address. So I should have put the ROM's address at 8 million, whatever, but the image, the load address is at 8 million, 2,000. Because the first two zero, zero, zero is the bootloader? Yes. So I should have, I, I didn't tell Ida the right thing. It's we don't care about the bootloader for this purposes, so okay. that's fine. Um, so it says, yeah, you, you've given me binary, but like, I don't know where the start is. I don't know what's code, what's data. So he's like, you're on your own. And like, this is all it's, it's not. It's like, here's the data. I don't know what to do with it. And it's just the raw bytes. Doesn't know what's code, doesn't know what structures. First thing I'm gonna do is gonna tell it like that prompt kept telling me, hey, we're gonna run in thumb mode. So I'm just, the, it's toggling that T to one, that big paragraph said basically, turn this to one if you think it's thumb, thumb mode. So I set it to thumb mode, and still, I don't know what to do. Well, it, the item doesn't know what to do. Is it because there's no debug symbols? Oh, there's no debug symbols. Uh, so an L file has like text section, read only data section. Um, there's none of, like there's, everything is just combined and thrown on the firmware. And so, like Ida's just like whatever. Um, I mean, we could we could tell Ida, hey, let's just assume it starts with code. And so it start like I told it, okay, start decompiling. And it doesn't like if this is code, this doesn't make much sense. And um, so here's this. Remember, I was telling you like 
if Ida is referencing something it doesn't know, right here, this red, it's saying, hey, that memory address, you didn't tell me anything about this, but it's referencing an, an address that doesn't exist. Um, if I went back here and looked up 2000, well, it's not going to show me it. Huh? Peripherals? So there are, so that's a good, I'll get to that. Um, two, <laughs> 2000 is the RAM address. Okay. 4000 is where peripherals start. And we'll talk about peripherals while I'm figuring this out. Um, so peripherals. It's got to be VMware auto sizing. Whatever is auto sizing. I'm not a fan of it. Um, but what we did was not correct. Um, that is not code. So I'm going to tell it, undo it all. Just, no, I was wrong. So how ARM processors work, they have what's called a interrupt table. Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, they have an interrupt vector table that is um, usually at the, the root of the ROM address. Or it's copied. It's actually at 0, 0, but it's copied from the ROM. And so basically, any kind of interrupt, like, uh, it has a different handler for each interrupt. So IRQs, um, a fault, a bus fault, um, they even like, like an IRQ for, I mean, you can set IRQs for just about anything, right? And you set the IRQ number. When, you, when there's an IRQ, it goes to this table, looks at this address, and then jumps to the function that's at that address. So I can just find, if I find this table, it's gonna be full of pointers to functions, right? And the one, there's one pointer for reset. So when the chip is reset, it's going to start executing whatever's at that function. So I'll just go find that pointer and start there. That's what I'm going to do. And so that's usually stolen from the first of the ROM. The bootloader makes it at our offset. So let's go fix this. I need to like a shortcut key for this. Um, if anybody has a spare brain cycle and can, can tell me how I can fix this, I would love to hear it. This is going to get old. Switch to Switch Linux. To Linux. <laughs> uh, turn off oh, uh, auto scaling in VMware. Open your browser in the VM. Oh, to go to the page. So you get a right, get that, that might be a good idea for, for the intermediary fix. So turns out this is that vector table. So I just say, oh, that's a pointer. The first pointer is off to somewhere it doesn't know, so I just marking it as red. Um, but the second one, which should be the restart counter, goes somewhere. Is and I'm just gonna just work my way down this list. And there's just a hotkey that makes it a pointer. Y yeah, I just I'm just hitting. What am I hitting? U, I think. I don't know. My hands do it. I don't think. Um, <laughs> so this second one. Oh, I'm not going to, I about did it. The second one, if you recall what the vector table said, that's the reset one. So we'll go to that address, and I'll say, hey, this is a function. So I'm going to hit the P key to make that a function. Now, I'm actually going to hit the address above what it points to, because here's the funky thing with, um, with arm and thumb. If, it's a, if the address you're jumping to is arm, then, then the jump location is the actual location. If the address you're jumping to is thumb code, it's the location plus one. And I did, it's like a sneaky way to slide that in the bits. So because the jump locations to uh, uh, this address, I'm actually going to start up here. I already told it it's in thumb mode, so I'm just going to say, okay, make a function here. And Ida is going to be like, okay, this is a function, and anytime this function calls something else, I'll go make that a function, right? It starts like walking, spidering down the code paths and turning everything into functions. And so up here is gray, or this yellowish color is just stuff it doesn't know, and blue is functions. So by me programming this one function, it called all these other little functions and it parsed them out for me. Okay, so I still, I'm, I'm right here, I, call, I made this a function. This doesn't look anything like what we were looking at on the ELF, right? Like this doesn't look like what we were looking for. I was looking for a setup and a loop around main, or a loop around loop. Um, any ideas? Why it doesn't look like it? Yes? Um, no, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you had a question? Yeah, I'm curious. I mean, couldn't you just say, like, hey, this is an Arduino board. Let's search for loop. 
Yeah. Or okay. Like set it for yeah, I could I could search for those strings. Or like main. Or yeah, I could search for them. All those strings. I'm, I'm gonna tell you, so I can find them. All those stri uh, symbols were stripped, right? Like. Okay. For the embedded processor, it's like, this is not necessary. We're going to be as small as possible. Yeah, so it, it doesn't have those parts of the ELF file. It doesn't know the function names because there's no debug symbols. Yep. So the debug symbols aren't even in this binary anyways. Even if it's not just like I doesn't know where they are, they're just not even here. It's been stripped out. So did some extra initialization code get inserted? Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> there's, there is some, we are looking at initialization code. Truth be told, this initialization code was in the ELF, but Ida was like, we'll skip over that and we'll jump right to main because I, Ida knew where main was. Ida no longer, there's no concept of main, so Ida's just like, hey, you said this is a function, here's that function. And yes, this is that initialization code. It's actually in the ELF too, um, but the ELF just skipped over it. So this is initialization function. It's kind of ugly. I'm going to make it look at the tree view. So, so wait, in an ELF file, does the entry point not have to be the main function? The entry point is most commonly not the main function in an ELF file because there's some, there's some initialization that gets you your console arguments and your environment variables set up. Like the CRT, in Windows, it's the CRT runtime. In an ELF file, there's some initialization functions that set up those variables because you're, and then it calls your main with your argv pointer, your argc command. All of that's set up for you. I think okay. I remember reading about this now. I'm yeah, like, I can't remember it's coming what, back to me. What it's what the entry point is actually called usually. Yeah, so all of this is doing this. That's all this is doing is it's setting some things up, um, and then at the end it branches to this function. Does this look slightly familiar? Yeah, that's, that's our nice. that's our setup function. Well, or or this is our this here's the loop, the right? Loop. This is the main that calls the setup and the loop, right? But it doesn't, Ida doesn't know their names, but we looked at the other one and we recognize this. Now, if we didn't look at the other one, but your guess would have been as good as mine what this function is, right? Like, we, only because we saw that other context do we recognize this. Can we name the functions so that sure. we recognize Sure, so we can, I can name this setup and I can call this loop. And that is something I typically do when I'm working on malware or anything, if I, have an idea what a function does, I'm going to give it a name. It might not be the right name, but I'll give it a name and I'll use underscores to kind of show my um, confidence in my name. So if I've got a lot of underscores at the end of the function name, that tells myself, I'm guessing, I'm really pulling the strings. That's just my own convention, but yes, you had a comment? Um, now, can you, I mean, see the structure of the way this code is calling itself? Like it's, it's obviously something is setting up and then calling a loop that runs and make, you can make inferences about yeah. that. What, what are some like structures that jump out at you immediately? Is there anything in particular that you um, I mean, like this, obviously. The loop, that's hey, a good call. A that's a good call. I'm trying to think of some other structures that uh, that are good like that. Yeah. And anything, uh, if if otherwise, a loop like this with no return, I would think it's an error handler, right? Like oh, a hard fault, okay. like it's just going to jump to this function that's never going to return. So when I see a loop like this, that would be actually my first thought is, oh, that's probably the error handler. Um, but in Arduino, we know that Arduino loops forever, so that's common for Arduinos. But um, not using Arduino, using other frameworks, error handlers are typically a loop forever. Um, okay, so let's look at setup for a little bit. Setup looks a whole lot uglier. What happened? We don't have this. Oh. Well, but setup was like one function call before, right? And now it's this huge function with this switch case. Anybody remember where we saw the switch case before? In our... In the pin setup function. Yeah. So what happened? It's the combined. Yes, somebody said, is that what you were going to tell me? Yeah, I was just going to say it doesn't know that it's a uh, library function call, so it's just this is part of the function. Yeah, uh, Ida made the assumption, and I'm assuming it made the assumption because it's only called here. It's like, oh, that is all part of this one function, it, and so it just it just blended them to the two together. Are they in different spots in, in like really far away? Or well, let's let's see here. Let me jump up to the screen. Together. So setup is at two one two C, and it branches to it does a branch to four three zero zero. So there, that's a little ways away. Um, so they're separate, but Ida 
typically, typically when you call a function, you branch and link. Branch and link means go there, but then when done, come back. Okay. Branch means just go there. It's like a jump. Just go there. I don't care. And this is doing a branch to the pin header thing. It's again, it's an optimization. There's no reason to come back to setup because setup's got nothing else to do. So it says just call the pin thing, and when you're finished with the pin thing, go back to my parent. That's basically an optim uh, compiler optimization that happened here. And Ida's just reversing it and saying there's no there's no delineator between setup and pin and it. That's all one function now. It's branch just because it's a multi multi core multi thread versus being like just a jump command. Uh, no, branch that is branch is a jump. It's just that's oh. the instruction. I'll bet it's called I'll bet it's, it's called in arm. So in like arm x86 exactly. is called jump. Okay. In arm, it's just a branch. Okay. I'll bet if we set up multiple pins, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be doing this. Yes. Because so, if we had two or three pins that got set up, it would 100% have recognized it as a separate function. I'm not going to spend time to do that, but if we had multiple calls to this, then the compiler won't optimize it that way because it knows this, this function is going to be called three times. So uh -huh. then, yeah, the setup would have a branch and link to this address and then hit it each time. Um, what else do we want to see? Let's go back and look at loop real quick. Okay, loop, set something to R0, and then calls a function. What's going on? What's this byte, 8, 6, whatever, it's putting in R0? Remember, R0 is the, the first it's... argument, right? What's that? Starting the loop. Uh huh. Or or starting the loop. Wasn't what, what? that the string that it passed in? That's right. That was the dashes and dots. But it doesn't look like dashes and dots. Or at least Ida doesn't know. But if we go there, <laughs> there, there it is. is. There it is. And I can tell Ida, hey, this is ASCII. Oh, oh, now I get you. And so if we go back to this, oh. now it's like, oh, okay, okay. So you can do things to help, right, put things together at what's going on. And so then here's that function, and it looks just like the other function. But again, these are not the right types. Cool. Kind of get, like, jumping to this first would have been a lot harder, but we're kind of seeing, like, you you kind of learn how the, the process can go. A lot of times you don't get the intermediary step, right? Only when you're doing your own stuff do you get that. Because we went from the original C code to the ELF binary with symbols to this that's got nothing. Questions before we go even deeper down the rabbit hole? Um, what, where's the sleep function? Yes, so the sleep would be down, I think this would have been the sleep. What? No, this would have been no, the sleep. Sorry. Back. Yep. This is this is the branch back to the top. But here's the branch link that should go to the delay. And then what's inside yeah, the you delay? Can the delay is just one big busy loop, which <laughs> makes sense, right? Like yeah. it just calls itself yeah. endless times until the counter reaches whatever and branches out. Three hundred and then leave. <laughs> yeah. That actually makes sense once you call it delay, because once you call it delay, it done it for the other one. Yep. That Everywhere the, that function is being called, it replaces that name with the delay. And it matches our ELF file much closer. Yeah. So when you start, do you go through malware? Say you have to look at everything, right? Do you uh -huh. just start naming stuff? I do. Just, I just, do. just shoot it in the dark. One of the first things I'll name is I'll look for errors, error strings, and the function that's being called with that string, I'll call it log error, right? Like, <laughs> or, and then I might, or I might figure out later, oh, that's not log error. That's actually printf. Right, like I just start with things that I can get a, a handle on. Can you search for certain structures, like we were talking about? How error handlers will often be just an endless loop. Can you search for like, hey, look for things that call themselves endlessly? Um, it's kind of hard to do such because you can only really search on the the pattern, right? And so, okay, so this is just showing me the assembly code. I'm going to turn on um, the actual bytes, the machine code. Okay, so these are the bytes. So for example, these four bytes represent this branch and loop instruction. And what this really is, is FD is the instruction branch and loop, and this is the offset to, to loop. So this is a negative, like two's complement, if you guys remember, two's complement this, well, if, hopefully, I was gonna say from your EE classes, right? All of you have taken EE. <laughs> So to complement, this is a negative number, which basically I think it's like negative 
it's got to be something small. Um, but uh, f that, and, and the order's weird too. But anyways, it's basically saying branch back up. How many spaces? It looks like it branches back up to right here. Well, no, sorry, this one. This is the right one. This is the branch up E7. E7 is like negative. Somebody want to do a quick two's complement? I'm kind of curious now. It's, it should be four or eight. I'm, I'm, I'm getting in there. Or 16. So nope. E would, would be, be six. Four? It'd be 24. Right? I don't know. All right, don't worry about it. So that's just saying branch back up to here. It's hard to look for that because you don't know how big the branch is, right? Maybe maybe the loop is, if there's more than one function, that offset's going to be different. I can't just look for an FC because FC occurs everywhere. FCs right. are pretty common. So it's I, I couldn't really search for this pattern because those offsets are very unique to where it's currently. Next time I compile this, and change something, those, those addresses will be different. So it's hard to search for that structure. There are different instructions that you can search for. This loop's hard because it's a relative offset, but like encryption uses known, like you XOR this with this value, you can then look for those constants or um, like uh, a certain pattern. Um, Yar is good at this where you could be like this byte within four or five of this byte within four or five of this byte and that that allows for some shifting if you're trying to make a signature for malware or something so it's possible but it's not my go-to but uh keep that in mind because you'll you, if you keep that in mind you might save the day later today um any other questions before i scrap this and we start something different cool let's do the infinity stuff that's where i'm going now <laughs> okay we i think we got far enough in Here's what, so here is, he, my friend gave me a bunch of firmware files from the different times he got firmware back from his friend. He had a serial in there. So we could, we could like compare the differences between these firmwares and try to see, let's say, okay, how about this? Our goal is to figure out how to subvert his serial number locking, right? How would you go about that? Where's some, what are some ideas, yes? Compare multiple bin files and see what's different. Yeah. And try to find out where serial numbers are stored. Do you yes. know which serial number was yeah, which bin file? Yes. I know a ser I know a ser he told me his serial number. I have it in this spreadsheet. Or not, do, not, do, we, do we want to hide the serial number? Or? I'm sorry, we need it. Okay. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So would you even need either for something like this? Because if it's a fixed length number, maybe a hex editor is good enough. Yes, that's a great answer. Unfortunately, no. I searched the binary for this pattern. The serial number does not show up in any of these binaries. But okay. that would be my go-to first answer as well. Yeah. well. But then you can cross compare what you get and say, hey, this is different, so the serial number must end up this way. OK, yes. Um, if the changes are not very much, if it's only like a small change, Unfortunately, um, I'm going to save the time, they varied a lot. So not, those weren't the only changes in between. Probably because of different compiler versions. Or and... different features. Maybe he's made changes to the code. Mm -hmm. So okay. unfortunately, there was a lot more changes. But that's a good idea. I, those are both good ideas. They the just main, didn't work I'm, in this case. Is that a pretty main code? Oh, it's got to check the hardware somewhere to get the serial number from the hardware. And I'll bet we could write some code to pull, do the same thing and look for what we're looking for. Okay. I like that. We're, let's let's roll with that one. Okay. Is there a better way? Let's do no, better you're way. fine. I'm just holding my breath because I'm going to go like this. Um, <laughs> I have, we have a suggestion on how to fix that. <laughs> okay. Tell me your suggestion. Uh, well, when you switch back, we'll fix it. Oh, okay. Um, where's the window I want? Somewhere. It's this one, I bet. Uh... I think that's the word I want. Yes, there it is. Okay. Um, this is the unique device ID that my friend told the serial number that he had to tell um, the, the, the whoever to make it work with his. This ID is found, like, you, you read this memory address to get that ID, right? 
So like Bash was saying, we need to find out. Yes. Now is that hard coded or can some, can you obfuscate that with code? Um, Could you say you can, like offset? So or you, you can off you can obfuscate that, but at some point you need to read that address. Okay. Right. What I my first thought is I didn't know how to remember how we did like show me where this is being referenced. We can go to this memory address and say show me where this is being referenced. Unfortunately, I did again was like this time was like. I don't see it ever being referenced. Um, so the next thought was, let's search for that pattern. But if it's obfuscated, it's not going to come up, right? Um, that address is hard coded, but you can obfuscate. You can like load this half and then load this half right. later, right? And you can obfuscate it. So let me cut that value. But they'd have to like try and obfuscate this, right? Which and most people are writing C code, right? They're not paying attention to what gets loaded underneath. And this is like a defined variable, so that there's a good chance it's Promising. it's available. Yes. Yeah, I've thought an idea. So if I'm lazy and I'm going to be making these each time someone contacted contacts me to add one of these, I'm not going to make a new one each time. I'm just going to have an array that has every serial number uh -huh. that I have been added. And so this is the reason why it's changing each time. Uh -huh. And also it means that we've got an array that has a bunch of very similar values in it. Yes. Yes. So you are 100% right. They do have an array of values. And we'll get to what they are. Um, how are you going to identify that array, though, and where it is is the hard part. Um, but you're right. You're like, what would I make? And let's look for that. That's a beautiful idea, a method of working. Did you have Go to your resolution, and instead of changing the resolution, change your display scaling. What does that say? Just don't worry about it. OK. Wait till you fix your scaling. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of it, see where it says 100% recommended? Uh -huh. Switch it to something higher. Is this higher? Yeah. Hopefully it's higher. Oh, look at that. If it's lower. That that's all helps. you get. What? All right, that was my only idea. Higher. Okay, that was slightly helpful. Uh, yeah, advanced settings should let you get that higher. Yeah, it should let you Have go. Have some scaling. Oh yeah, do 200. Do 250. 500, this is going to be huge. <laughs> all right, all right, you got me scared. <laughs> it says not recommended there. Oh, until you sign out. Oh, I ain't gonna do that. Right. No, we're gonna put that back to one hundred because I don't want to wake up to three pixels in the morning. <laughs> okay, we were right there. Okay, good news is I think I'm done switching back and forth. Uh, fix the scaling. Oh. Well, I leave the scaling the same yeah. and choose a new resolution. So at least just leave it alone. Just go. Just yeah. 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 This is this, but it's so okay. Okay. Can you put it in dark mode? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're killing me. Uh, yeah, I need a little bit more resolution. Scroll down. Okay. And then up, up, up. Oh, jeez, rip. Oh. Yeah. So <laughs> keep the scaling the same. Just change your resolution again. It's gonna make okay, it. You want that higher scaling. It's um, going to make you sign out now that we messed with this advanced one. <laughs> so fix your res, I guess. New class. <laughs> right, so 1920 we'll... by 200. That works. Uh, we want a little better, right? Yeah, I think we want Whoa, wait, higher. Going the wrong way? Way? I'm going the wrong way. My bad. Yeah. So I think 1920, yeah. All right, this looks good. This is workable. All right, firmware. Okay, let's take the firmware. Not let you go above 150. Okay, again, we're doing a little ARM processor. It's going to tell me where do I want to start at. This is not an Arduino sketch, so we're actually going to start at the root of the ROM address and not use that offset of 20. Because it doesn't have a bootloader for Arduino. Yes. yes, we know, we know. All right. So again, it's like, okay, here's here's whatever. We're going to do the same steps. First off, we're going to assume thumb size because we're working on an embedded processor. And this is our vector table, our interrupt vector table. Whoa, 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 I hit the wrong button. My fingers are... I'm hitting O now that I look at what my hands are doing. All right, and then this is the one that's called initially. So if I make this a function... Watch that bar up there that's mostly blank. Watch as soon as I make this a function. Whoa. <laughs> oh, 
Ida just went through and spidered that thing. Isn't that cool? Magic. That's bad. <laughs> and I'm starting to see some cool strings. Emulator, LCD mode, shape check. Okay, cool. We've got some things. And I could I can actually just go ask. Wow, those are those are weird. <laughs> <laughs> Ida uh, doesn't play nice with resolution scaling. No, it doesn't. Open oh, sub view. I can say, show me all the strings you found. <laughs> and so here's different strings inside this binary, like copyright Activision. Okay, it probably means we shouldn't be here. Um, I mean, this was definitely not status. made by Activision. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <Yeah. laughs> it probably says that string you know, infinity base, one whatever. of many checks to see the authenticity. So yeah, we, yeah, it probably yeah. does. Okay, so what we're, we were going to look for an offset, right? We were going to look for an address. Uh, that's the address we were going to look for, I think. I'm not going to go back and verify. Just, it was. Yeah, okay. It was. Yeah. Okay. And find all occurrences of that string. Right. None. Zilch. Now, we are little Indian architecture, so that means little end in first, right? Oh. Let's Ooh, try the opposite. Exactly. Oh, still no good. Still no good. Not just part of it. So we could try to do part of it. Um, it's not going to hit. Okay. <laughs> what are, but we're on to something. What are some other things we can check? Yes? So we're checking the serial number itself. Let's check for any calls of the address. Sorry, that's what, we just checked the address. Oh. We haven't checked for the serial number, but I'm going to save us time. Serial number's not in there okay. in, in either form. What if you were to XOR the value? With what? I mean, we could try all 256. That may work, but it won't in this case. But that's an idea, too. What size is the thing we're trying to check for? Remember what it said on the other screen? 96 bits. 96 bits. How many bytes is that? I think it's 12. No. 96 divided by 8. 12. 12. So in hex, that's? 6. Look for long compares. Uh, 12 in hex is C. Um, so, if we could find like something that was like move, like I'm imagining a function call, right? That's going to be like copy, tw like mem copy 12 bytes from this address, right? We, off, for some reason we couldn't find the address, which is weird, but maybe we can find a time where it says move 12 into R1 or maybe R0. Um, so, we're looking for like a move, like maybe that'll work. All right, let's just, I'm, okay, I guess I'll be lazy. Let's just look for 12. Okay, 12 comes up, that, that byte comes up a lot, right? 4,000 times. 4,000 times. Uh -huh. But if we go on the instruction list, let's go down to the moves. Oh, wait, let's first sort by instruction and then go down to the moves. Okay, so we're looking for a move that value. Um, There's an 8,000. Did I pass it? Oh, wait, wait. Am F I going to pass? FFC0? No. No. Can you control F? Uh, no, I can't control F actually in this. What's that hack I got? Yeah, Is there a special instruction for reading the serial number? Um, in, di in this case, no. Microcontrollers, everything's a memory address. Mm -hmm. Peripherals, and so we just, just go read that. I thought this is how I did this. Um, maybe I didn't move S. No, it's not a move S. I think I passed it. Oh, maybe I didn't. Uh, I don't see. Old bugger. This was my trick. Now we really need to come up with a, another trick. I'm thinking. Uh, was it this binary or another one? Um, it might have been one of the others. It still should have. I was hoping it would work here. So we tried finding where it calls the address of the serial number. We tried finding the string of the serial number. Right, so like, oh, here was my other idea I told you didn't work. Let's go to that address, but okay. I just like, that address doesn't exist. Wait, it's a peripheral. What happens if you load one of these images that has the wrong serial number? Do you get an error message that says like bad serial number? That's a good point, I don't know. I, I didn't, I wasn't provided that information, I don't know. Uh, I'm we really might surprised. look for a bunch of compares based on my array theory. Okay, if we have a bunch of compares of twelve uh -huh. in a row, that's it's walking through that array. Uh huh. Um, so, 
I would I would argue they probably have a for loop. Yeah. yeah. If I yeah if and, and they do have a for loop, but you're you're about if we could search for a for loop comparing against, but but what are we comparing against? Because the serial number didn't show up. I really wanted. Well, to... Could you compile do the back to C code and then search within the C code? Um. Could you look at the structure and I find like a gatekeeper function that won't let you proceed well, past it? Was, It'll was probably be the beginning of the code, like the before are. anything loads. Okay, so let's let's try both of those ideas. Um, I'm not even on time. I'm because if we can find. Okay, so here's the entry point. Um, it looks pretty ugly, but we know this is going to jump to the main. So here's the main. It's referencing. This is. I didn't load the memory there, but so. It's, Complaining about those not being legitimate. Here's some main function. Let's see a little loopy down the bottom there. Uh, oh, is there a loop? Well, this looks like a bunch of if, like it does something that checks. Yep, if else, if else, if else. And then there's this final loop. So I bet you. Oh, That's but look what this loop is just doing. It's, it's just. It. It what do you think? This, yep, this is probably an error. If we get down here, where well, this is probably like an error handler. So, unfortunately, one of these many side ones is. Oh, look at these. I'll highlight it. They're all going to the same place. That That's exciting. It. Let's go check out what that is then. <laughs> all right, so this awesome. looks like some kind of, here's two loops over some other things. This could be a for loop. This could be. And then, but then it calls, but these call back up to the top like this. Again, there's not really a way out of this function the either. initial statement and then it keeps on calling. Yeah, so this looks like some kind of seemingly handler. No exit condition. Yep, and seemingly no exit. All of these exits lead to the same a loop. So maybe this is. We might not be able to do anything. So the bottom, if the bottom's an error handler, then maybe this one. Yeah. Ooh. ooh okay. Oh, this okay. is promising. Oh. <laughs> but not a lot here, um, except for it branches to this function. There's a branch. Any other branches I see in here? No, nope, that's it. So this function we'll call this guy. And this guy who compares something four bytes at a time. That, okay, that might be useful. Oh, but again, no, 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 maybe. So it does do a, this looks like a for loop, and then it leaves, and here's the exit. And it compares, what is it comparing? R1 to R0. So uh, do we know anything about the structure of the serial numbers? Can we go IPv Can we look at the strings the again? Section of the serial number. Look for error strings. Um, yeah, that would be a good idea. That's a, that's a possibility. It doesn't help in this case, but that would be that's a good thing to look at. I'm trying to keep us moving fast, though. So. Yes. Look, maybe we, it would be helpful to look at the strings and see if any strings pop uh, out. Oh yeah, yeah. Was there any kind of error string that's like bad serial, right? Uh, bad message. Bad argument. Mm -hmm. Um, copyright. Disney. How did that get there? Skyland. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, the copyrights are probably something that sends to the app in order to. Yeah. Whoever made this, like I don't know how they. It's a dirty environment. Yeah. How how yeah how they procured whatever they got. We don't know. Because um, so so the, the, the in those strings there were these product names. Go back right there that you're the 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 arrows and the dashes. Uh huh. Here. Down farther. These. Oh look, there's error. Big error. Yeah, I can make that a string. Error empty something. And then ask it, hey, where's this being used? But it it doesn't uh, know. You're also getting another set of error empty what? Yeah. Again, I can make these strings, but it it doesn't know. There's no references to them. So I just like you would see something like this if it's being used. So I just not wise enough to tell us. Okay, because like the, that, that last one you just did looks like it was the arrow keys for the way that this thing works. Oh, okay. I've never played with this, but so, th are those around the time it does the serial check? No, this would be after it's booted. Okay. Wow. I figured you could like work backwards from somewhere in. I was in. gonna say, can you follow? I guess you got. Yeah, you probably want to go before all the like brands such as Skylanders and the Lego Portal, because those are probably. You know, select uh -huh. what device you're using. Uh-huh. Oh, I'm still upset with that. That's what I planned on doing. Uh, I might have to cheat. 
but I don't like so, so somehow it has to read that address in memory. Yes. It's not referencing it by the address. Yes. Was there anything in the processor documentation to suggest a different way to access that memory? No. It does have to read that address. And the I'm, I'm going to cheat here and tell you that it does reference that address, but it builds that address not by loading it into the register all at one time. What? I don't know if that was done by obfuscation or if it was just done by optimization. It's hard to place the blame on any one thing. What's the name of this So it'll thing just call chunks of the serial number at a time? No. Um, no. Call chunks, it adds a bit and then it adds well, a bit. The address, adds to get the address. I'm, to build the maybe, address. maybe what oh, I practiced on was this board. It slowly builds the address. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat and go to one that I already looked at. And let's see. Let's just try what I was trying before. Okay, those didn't work. Those didn't work. That should work. I'm really hoping it works. And sort by instruction. We, well, I thought I sorted by instruction. Come on. Why are you... Oh, I've got to turn that off because it's messing me up. Okay, now you can sort. I don't suppose we have like an emulator that we could have loaded this. I mean, I have this chip here that is not on the serial list. Because if, if we could set a breakpoint on accesses to that memory address, that would have really help. Oh, okay. Here's a few moves where it's moving C and R. Um, zero. Cross hash? No, it doesn't matter. Really so. Do you know what the name of this? this thing is that we're trying to break? What it's called? Yeah. So if it pulls things like one by one, Skylanders. if it pulls parts of the serial number one by one, maybe we can just right. search sequential references of the serial number even if it is one by one. So like A, search for if A has B, B, and C has D, so on and so <coughs> forth. I'm cheating. Um, I heard that um, it halts after the copyright string when oh. you load in something with the wrong okay. serial. Like that's the, what actually happens. Um, so if you load it on a device, it'll show you the copyright string. It'll show you the copyright string? So, so it, it loads, it shows you the copyright string, and then it halts and crashes and doesn't change anything on the screen anymore. All right, I cheated. Um, that's what it was. It was stupid. All right, it was a compare. Not a, In this one, it's a compare. In the other one, it's a move. So this is the function that's of interest. I want to show you something real quick. I'm going to turn this function into C code. And it's not... What I, maybe that's not what I wanted then. Crap. Here's this is this is usual. This is par for the course. This is normal. Um, when I'm reverse engineering, I come up with ideas, and I try them, and then I look at them, and they're not correct. Yep. Just beat my way through this. That looks right. Let's try this. Um, bugger. What are you doing? That's that's it. Okay. Oh, bugger. Okay. It, it's really, <clears throat> I think I chose the bad one. I really think they, this one, he, in 2019, he made it difficult. Let's, let's choose an older one. This is the function that's actually reading, but it's pretty ugly. <laughs> oh, I'm going to reveal all the secrets though. Okay. We're, we're go with this one. I've, you didn't see that. I am. <laughs> okay, I turned this in the f to. I turned this back into C, into C code. And where'd it go? Close your eyes. <laughs> see that thing. I'm going to open them. I'll tell you. Okay, go ahead and open them. Okay, check this out. 
Wait, what? Yeah, wait, what? We searched for it. I know we did. This is C code, which is not... Wait, we should have just... You, you, unfortunately, you can't, you can't, like, decompile everything and then let me search that, right? Like, you can only can decompile a function at a time. Like, this is, this is the assembly code, but when you turn to the C code, there it is. Isn't that, like, I want to kick something. Here's something, um, Ghidra. I did the same reversing with Ghidra. Ghidra did show me that number at that spot, and I could search on it. This is one time where Ghidra won and Ida, Ida was way more difficult than it needed to be. Yes? Why would this happen? Why? So I'm guessing it's doing the call in a more roundabout way since it's calling from C to C before it was assembled, but I wouldn't really know. Yeah, so it is building that value with a series of adds and subtracts like this, and then it, it, it puts them together. Um, so it's not why it does this, it could be an optimization added. thing. This, these instructions might be smaller than doing a full move a large value in there. I don't know. Maybe it was something that the author didn't see to obfuscate that memory address. But whatever it is, it could be that it was it could be in an obfuscation, but then the obfuscation got optimized or whatever. It's funny that. It's funny to me that the C code, like the pseudo C code, shows that value, right? Well, if it shows that value, that might rule out obfuscation. Yeah, that's a good point. But, and, and um, I'm just deleting things as we go. Here's this 12, right? So that address is put into var 29, and then here we see var 29, 12, 12 pass to it. This is probably like a, my first guess would be, this is mem copy. And this is some buffer, right? And then you see that buffer being used in these two functions before, or used before and used after. Maybe this is an init, but I don't know what this third one would be, right? I don't know what's going on with these, these functions, but it's doing something with that memory. It's doing something with my serial here, loading it into that. And then that value, does apparently isn't this isn't being used again, so we need to figure out what's going on here. Well, if we know it's a serial, let's name it serial. Well, yeah, okay. So let's call this read serial, right? Because that's what it's doing. It's reading the serial. Let's poke our heads into this function. Oh shoot! I'm giving it away. Um, it does a bunch of stuff, and it looks pretty funky. Like, look at this. I gave it away, but if I didn't give it away, Sorry, I'm blind. Is this okay. Really small. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> if I if I looked at the disassembly that matches that function, where was I? It would be butter. I lost my place. It would be around here. Nope. If I I went there, you would see. Uh, what's the name of this function? There you go. Eight oh oh four six two five. Okay. If I went here, these O O R Rs, that's XOR. Okay. XOR instruction does not happen very common. There's two places you'll see XORs. Um, one is it's a, an X sixty on X eighty six processors. It's kind of more common because XOR is a one byte instruction, and when you XOR a number with itself. What happens to that number? Anybody know? You get zero. You get zero. So in x86, when you need to load zero in a register, which happens a lot, it just XORs that register with itself. That, that's one place you'll see XOR a lot. You'll see XOR a number with itself. And then you'll just know that's a zero. The only other time you see XOR is when you're trying to hide something or encryption. But that's the only times you see X, right? Like it's just not a function that's that's common. So this makes me think this is some sort of encryption or encoding, whatever. Discord mentions that that is a bitwise OR, not an XOR. O -R -R. Oh, 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 wait. A bitwise OR. So not an XOR. Is it a non-exclusive OR? No, um, that's just an, yeah, just an OR. Um, there should be, okay. But this is uh, in encoding of some sort. Sorry, I got thinking about what you said. There should be XORs going on here too. Maybe I'm, there they are. The EOR. EOR is an XOR. Sorry. Um, thank Could you for calling me on that. Related to the actual 
uh, to decoding the NF uh, the NFCs on the little infinity trips themselves rather than it could be but remember we just saw it read the serial address like just before this okay okay so this is some kind of encoding function um, where is it being called I'm gonna say okay where is this encoding fun oops I just did that Oh, it's being called in this read serial function, this encoding thing. Where else is it being called? It's just being called in this read serial. So that's interesting. Okay, let's go back, go back to this view. Okay, and go back. Oh, I don't want to do that. Let's see, okay, where's read serial being called? It's being called in some functions that I named, but you shouldn't have seen. Um, Okay, so this read serial is being called. We talked about this one touching it before and one touching it afterward. Let's look at this one before. Okay, those are some those are some hard coded values being put in some registers. Somebody, so look, well, somebody. So this looks like six. You know, this is one, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Like, okay, that's just counting up, and this looks more more like counting up. This looks like a a kind of specific value. Um, somebody want to look for that on their browse browse that number? Look, see if it comes up in anything. Can you zoom in a couple more times. Oh yes, that's pretty tiny. Thanks, sorry guys. Maybe you're okay. Um, what's the best way for me to do that? <laughs> 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 Almost uh, worse. Oh, this doesn't support like Control Plus Plus or something like that. Uh, it does not. That's how I, I was hitting Control Plus Plus and I got that magnifier to show up. It says function referenced SHA one. Yes, and okay. you saw my so hints. That's a hash. So that's a hash. So. Nice. So it's hashing. So when do you know you should start googling random numbers? This so this looks time. like it. This looks like an initialization to me, right? Like it's setting up these registers. This all this function does, right? It does this, and then it sets these values and returns. That the the XOR was my first hint. There's some encryption going on here. So hard coded values with some encryption going on. I can just look for hard coded values, and like AES is going to have the S boxes that you can look for, right? Um, Yes. In fact, that whole string that it has, uh -huh. it's listing it here as the hash underscore initial default values. So that whole thing is um, your, your SHA you need, you need one to, and it. You need to init the whole thing with a long string, and that's pretty default for SHA and the way that SHA works. Okay. Um, so that's your SHA init. So what do you that. think this is? Yeah. You're feeding the data to your SHA function. Yeah. yeah. SHA update. Mm -hmm. And then the last one is then. Shaw finish. Somebody's somebody's done this before. Finish. So this is this is probably the the hash object. So where it gets saved to. Well, that, that's the object that's being used. Oh. But then when you finish, it's going to output a a hash a hash digest, right? Yeah. And and there's v twenty nine in Shaw update, which is our yeah. This is this this is our um, I should call that cereal? our serial. Okay, so our serial number is being thread to the SHA function, and then there's a hash digest, and then you see the hash digest is now used in this do while, aka for loop. Okay, so let's go see what. So it looks like it's using our hash digest. Um, it says, so our, our hash digest value of 17, and Value 17 Gets is being incremented by four uh, every time through. So an array, we're walking in the array, and how big is each item in the array? Four, four bytes. Four, four four bytes. bytes. Now, how big is a SHA hash? Way bigger. Way bigger. So that's a little weird. Um, but let's go see, let's go look up at 17. 17 is being set to this address. Let's go check out that address. Hey, look at that. Look at these the nice little four. I already preset this up. I Ida would have showed you. Oops. I would have showed you just like bytes, right? But I told it, hey, something, these are four byte things being read here. So show me the, all these four byte things. So this is some table. Uh, this is our array of good serial numbers. 
That's our hash table. That's that's what we would. That's what I'd assume. Um, but I gotta Maybe. go. Let's let's figure this out because it's only four bytes. Um, so what's our what's our serial we're comparing against? Yes. So let me. Uh, I can't see things. Hit the, hit the Sorry guys, I gotta go a little tinier so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so here's my serial number. So the bottom part of Ida here is a Python window. Um, so I'm just hash your serial. So yeah, let's just import hash lib and let's hash my serial number, right? Yep. Oh, that is so I'm tiny. Sure Holy face. goodness. Um, oh, I forget how to make it. I, I do this every time too. <laughs> every time I, I want that right there. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> All right, guys, let's oh, turn on the magnifier. Whoa, that was, that was really bad. Pour a glass to the demo gods. Yeah, okay, import hash lib. A equals my hash, my, my serial number. But it's not ASCII, it's like raw bytes. So I'm just going to have it decode it. Okay, so A is now my serial number like that. And I'm going to say <laughs> hashlib.sha1, hash my A, and dot, give me the hex digest of that one line here. That's my hash, okay? 33B18780 is the first four bytes. And now, if we go back up here, um, do you see that anywhere? No, scroll down. It might not be in this one. It might not be in this version. But also, we're on Little Indian, right? Oh. So you're going to want to look for 80, 87. You're going to look for the opposite, the other order. The universal groaning about Little Indian just brings <laughs> me joy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay. It might not be on this version. He told me he had a list and which ones it was on. Um, let me, I'm sad that it's not on this one. That's probably why I probably chose the wrong image to work with you guys with. Sorry guys. Um, let's go over to this one. Let's go over to the other one. And now I gotta go find my, my stuff. Did I mark it here? I didn't. All right, I got the wrong file again. I think I planned on, oh, cancel, cancel, wrong button. <laughs> this is the one I think I wanted. Isn't it? Maybe. Oh, this is this is this was my original work. When I knew what interest interest one. Like this is I knew it was playing with it, but I didn't know what it was doing. All right, I bet you it's it's got to be in there. Unless I did that wrong, or. We did that wrong. Let's see. And this is another scenario you can't search. Yeah, well, I could search for the, yeah, I could search for that that pattern of bytes. Um, Control F should be default memory program. Yes. <laughs> That's something I searched for in the past. That wasn't it. We're looking for three three. Oh, well, yeah, three three. In in one of two forms. Yeah. I looked at it. There, there it is. Three, three, one, B, eight, zero. But we don't want that much of it. We just want the four bytes. Oh, look, it's there. Oh, it is. Oh, you're right. There it is in our list. Yeah, it was. It you were right. It's down toward the bottom of our list. <laughs> so we found out we are in this approved list. Okay, how do we hack it? Uh, what do you want to do? There's a lot of answers to this point we'll now. A lot to of the list. Yeah, well, we could just put our new serial on the list. However, my friend says he goes through these pretty often, right? So every time he breaks one, now he has to come to us to put it on there. Different options? Just pull out the thing that he wants. Always true. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right. Just force wow. him to return one. Yes, 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 yes. So let's go back. Turn one. There you go. <laughs> this function right here, right, where it... it it loops over the, 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 let me pull this. We don't need this this big anymore. Where's my function keys? Um, all right. 
Where's my Shaw init? So there's this do loop, right? And if, let's see. So it's looping through these here. This function. So is label 51 the error path? That's a good question. Which is the right path? How do you know? If it is not v21, so if it doesn't, if sub thing doesn't come out as true, uh -huh. it's going to go to that label 51. So let's yes. just let's just get rid of uh, that whole section 199 and no op those two. Yeah, what, what, we we need to replace the instructions with instructions of identical size. So just no ops, right? But you can you can put in as many no ops as you need to fit it. Um, yes, that could, as long as. So this is where it jumps. At, this is the loop. This part either gets skipped, it gets skipped or gets run. We just don't know. You, do we? Which one do we want? Do we want this to run or do we not want this to run? You've got a while forever. While one. While where's while? Down one? down more. Oh down here. This is some. Yeah, this is this is where we jump to. Well, I was gonna say either yeah. way. Either way, we end up here. So this is probably a good place to be. The question is: Is this stuff right here? Do we want that or not? It's setting a lot of values to zero, so my guess is no, right? Like it's, it sounds like it's, it looks like it's wiping something. Um, also, I'll give you a hint. That's a mem compare. What if a if the memory if the two memory segments are the same? What does mem compare return? Zero. Zero. So if they're not the same. So, so it returns zero. So what is this saying? If, if uh, not uh, zero. It does, because it's going through all the possible values. And as soon as it finds one that's good, then it jumps out. Then it jumps out. So we do want to jump out. And we don't even. So basically, right, like if we could just come right here and just say, go if to. we could put this basically go to here, up here, we could skip that whole process, right? OK. So now we know what we want to do in theory. Or we could replace the if with a no op. We could just force it to return oh, yeah. one. Yeah, it, or if you just replace this with a no op, then it's going to compare the first one and then just go there. That's a beautiful answer, and it's even easier than trying to calculate a jump offset. Let's that's, do it. That's that's a great way to do it. Um, so label five. Let's let's well, get this is pseudo code, right? Like I can't I change, can't change label fifty one to something we recognize and then go look for it in the actual. Um, not so much. Label 51 doesn't show up in, like, it doesn't, those are just in there. Oh. Um, but Is it, I, I it call possible it, to feed a good serial number into it always? So go to where we're reading the serial number and just change that output into a good? Yes, we could do that. But we can't, we can't, that memory is reading from a memory address. We could change the memory address it's reading from to somewhere in ROM and then put one serial number we know is good there. But remember, we have to know it's going to take that value and it's going to compute a SHA on it. Okay. So we're going to go backwards from a SHA hash and come up with a string oh. that will compute that. So that's yes. probably not, not work. So we've got this CMP, which is compare, looking for zero, which is what we want. And if it finds it, it goes to location wherever. Yes. So just get, get rid of that compare and just no op it. And then it'll go to. So, so this is branch if equal, right? Well, can we just make it always branch? So we can make we can change this. Yes, we can either make this a branch always. Um, we could also change this compare to one. So basically, but what about people who are already approved? Or if <laughs> that's true, <laughs> well, but it's going through the it's going through all twenty of them, right? So if you're bound to find you're, something. You're not going to match on all twenty. Your serial number is only going to match on one, right? So Let's we just... could we could make this a one, or we could make this a branch always. Yeah, there's there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have like even if we change this bit. I should I should have brought my thing because I have one. Oh, okay. I should have asked you. Oop. So basically, let's go here. Options general. Turn on the op code so we can see them. Okay. So here's the bytes that represent this. This compare zero zero. Like we could just change that zero zero to zero one in the binary, and we're good to go. Um, moreover, it's like if I go back to this view, I can see I'm this at one e three eight. I should. S oh, why did it take away my? I told you to show me then, please. I really do want it. Okay. So at one e in the in the binary at that offset, we should find a zero zero twenty eight, and we could just change that to a zero one. So we do that in hex editor. Yeah, or you just go open that bur that firmware file. Let's see, see. 
I know I've got it on here. I just can't spell it. I always get the H and the R backwards. Why do I not have it on here? What am I smoking? I have a hex editor usually installed. And I don't know why it's not coming up when I search for it. Uh, Windows. <laughs> I, I could you want to search the web, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what I want. Right only an edge. <laughs> Apparently I don't have it installed. Okay. Can you um, patch things in just Ida? Not so much. Yeah, Ida doesn't do that very well. Um, it's, it's possible, like with plugins, but it's not very clean. So I would have to go take a hex editor and patch that. Where, where was it? Right here. But Wait, you where patch was it in so you would patch it and just die drop, right? I think so, but I don't personally. Ginger does that. allow you to patch. I've done it before. So okay, you would cool. just patch it and then re-upload the. Yep. Re-upload it on the. Yep. Audio. Yep. 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 And that was all. And that's all we need to do. My friend did do this, and he now does not have this problem anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> questions? I think we're at, we're at nine o'clock. Hey, that's pretty good timing, right? Yeah. Did we? Was that comprehensible? I oh, sorry, so I had some trouble there. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you.